Now, uh, I thank you all very much for coming. And it's actually an honor to represent you guys in MSB. Um, it's uh, a, a feeling from the whole store that it's one of the best decks on the planet, and then that's one of the reasons why we're representing it. And you're sure, I'm sure you're going to find this out. Um, yeah, I started in the North Bay here in 1985 as a, as a sales guy, and I opened up my own store in S uh, Sonoma County in uh, 1996, and just been growing ever since. Uh, I did sell the one up in Santa Rosa, and uh, I had to sign a non-compete so I couldn't do anything for five years. And uh, at the end of five years, I had my kids helping me in the summertime, you know, when they were off school and everything. The non-compete went away and they said, why don't we just open up our own place again? So we found this place here and that's how it all started roughly about 10 years ago. So my three sons work here. Uh, my youngest son does most of the IT work. My middle son is a project manager installer. And my oldest son, he takes care of all the money, all the finance part and everything else. And I have to ask his permission to buy stuff in. Yeah, so it's kind of... <laughs> And, uh, and uh, so that's where we are here today. Yeah, so how the, what, what, it, what the system consists of here, we uh, started uh, putting this together. These speakers are brand new from Canton. That's the reference ones. You may be the f one of the first in the United States to hear them. Uh, they're a phenomenal speaker. They're going to be here next Saturday if anybody wants to come in. Uh, Nordos is going to be here on Thursday on the same, talking about the same system and Canton on Saturday. And it's, the system will be here during the whole week. Uh, after that, we have to return it back as this is on loan from MSB. And uh, I think we're getting serial number one, one of the first production runs. I hope I'm trying to push them a little bit. And we hopefully we're, we'll have the system back up and running in roughly three or four weeks, you know, plus or minus, depending on a few things. And anyway, so we have the, uh, the Canton Reference 1. Uh, we're primarily wired by Nordos here. And uh, we're, uh, we're using the Lumen Streamer, which is, uh, there's no preamp. We're using the DAC as the preamp. So it, it's a very simple path. Streamer from the internet into the DAC and up the amplifiers and the speakers. And we do have an MSB CD player in here, which we'll be playing as well. Can you mention uh, what model of Lumen? And this is the U1. Which is uh, it does not have a DAC in there. They have the uh, they have one above it, the X1, which has the, the the DAC in it. If you do not have an outboard DAC, it's a very good one for what it is. But uh, you're 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 even way better off going with even the you know the, the entry level discrete DAC from MSB walks all over it. You know, and it's there's a few thousand dollar difference, but if you enjoy, you know, you have to weigh that yourself, and we can do the demonstration of that in the store at any time as well. So this is their reference piece. I believe it's ninety eight hundred dollars, and uh, it's uh, it's it's new. It's called the U one X, and it's uh, it has an upgraded power supply. And uh, as you've heard, some of you've heard already, I mean, it's got just incredible detail and everything. And uh, yeah, and that's pretty much the the signal path here. And uh, the, the, I'll just throw in the power cords there, I make myself. Oh, and we're also using the brand new uh, the power boxes there from mm -hmm. Nordos. That's their brand new one, the Cubase. And uh, it's an extraordinarily quiet, because part of the, the, you know, the system is part of the, the whole is how it sounds. And this is giving us nice clean power, because we're in a kind of an industrial area here. The power here is surprisingly good. For, for what it is, but uh, that brings it up a little level. What's the amplification that you're using? Sorry? The amplifiers, what are Oh you? yeah, these are the, uh, the mono blocks, they're 500 watt from MSB. Okay. And uh, a little more power than we need, so, but uh, we can actually drive these speakers a little bit harder than they normally would go because we'll have the excessive power, because as we know, it's a lot easier to, to blow a, a speaker with you know 20 watts than it is 500 watts. Yeah, the distortion is what you want to avoid. Okay, so I would like to take this opportunity to invite uh, to introduce John and Jonathan and Daniel and Vince from MSB. Like we, we said, graciously came up here for this event here, and I am going to learn the same amount as you because I know almost nothing about it as well. I just set it up for the sound, so I'm very anxious to hear what they have to say. So, all right, okay. All right, well, good morning, guys. Um, my name is Daniel Goldman. This is my brother, Jonathan oh, Goldman, and our US sales manager, Vince Galbo. 
Um, Jonathan and I are owners, and we have a third partner at the company who is another owner, and that's kind of our core company is the three of us doing all the design work and management at the factory. So we can start by going, I guess, into the history of MSB a little bit, kind of explain where we came from. You want to take over that for a little bit, or? Uh, yes. <laughs> well, from my perspective, I've been with the company since uh, 2006, and uh, uh, part-time, and when I saw ladder technology, I said, Digital's ever going to be anything. It will be this, and and I didn't know, you know, how far it would go. And I, uh, I I'm proud to say that every time you know engineering comes up with, oh, we have a new idea, and oh, and it measures better, and therefore it should sound better. And without exception, it's always been the case. So it the resolution keeps improving. Uh, and it's all about precision. I think one of the ways I think about it is I, I view MSB as a company that they're as much about measurement as they are, you know, uh, digital audio design. And uh, always following the measurements and this, very importantly, this, in my mind, the science. And uh, it's amazing. And it's, it's with the Cascade, um, the ads in the, in the magazines, we just put a heading and said, it's not the recording. And it really became apparent to me with this deck, and, and I've seen this trajectory over time. It's like, you know, Tony was alluding to the, the <coughs> resolution of CD versus higher res PCM or DSD. And they have started to equalize. And the re I think the realization is that CD being, you know, less data, less often versus higher res, it just required more precision. And the precision numbers are, for me, I mean, they're insane if we elaborated on the precision of the clocks and the precision of the ladders. And uh, these are all things that, uh, uh, you know, are done with all the robotic pick and place machines, the proofing, um, you know, how the resistors are located in the ladders, just a, a myriad of things that keep improving that, uh, that has resulted in a more and more natural analog sound. And the thing that's surprising for me is that you say, well, I put in this brand XYZ deck, and I'm hearing more information, but it's, it's somehow not quite right. Uh, it doesn't quite sound right. And, you know, these, for, in my mind, it's the artifacts. The artifacts are mixed in with the dense harmonics, especially like the full orchestra, big band jazz, things like that. And that seems to be that, you know, digital has always struggled with. And it's remarkable to me that, and uh, the people who own our decks, and we get these comments constantly, there's a lot more information. This recording that I know so well, I know every moment of it. And I'm hearing all these new things, and the things that I knew were there, are just so much uh, more defined. Uh, but at the same time, it's even more relaxed, which is a new experience for many people with digital. So, you know, we get those comments constantly. And, you know, I joke that if I don't get that feedback from a customer, we only work through our dealers, but I end up talking to a lot of customers. And if we don't get that feedback, I, I can be a pest. <laughs> And, and, and help the customer and or the dealer uh, work through the power, Ethernet filtering, the things that we have discovered that uh, make a difference. So that's been, um, that's been my experience. As far as the history of the company, you're yeah, probably I'll, better. I'll, I'll start with my, <laughs> so the company is basically as old as me. Um, almost to the year. Um, so I obviously wasn't very involved at the beginning of the company. Um, but uh, post-college, I graduated with a mechanical engineering degree. And I came back to MSB. Uh, it was quite small at the time, like three people. So it was just kind of a skeleton company that was running along at that time. Um, Jonathan was also graduating just before me. And so we kind of jumped into the company to try to, you know, bring it, bring it to life, make something of it because we saw the potential there. And um, so for me, mechanical engineer, uh, first thing I wanted to do was bring manufacturing in-house. 
So I bought a Haas Super Mini Mill, and that was sort of my first experience with CNC machining. And I made the analog DAC on that product, and that was sort of like, you know, trial by fire. Uh, perfect educational tool. The yeah, Haas Super Mini Mill is like, some people buy them for their garages. Yeah, the first time I fired it up, I ran the spindle right into the table. I had no Just idea shattered what shattered the whole thing. And, and, and may I interject, we were at the bamboo farm at the time, and I visited, and Daniel said, oh, come on, you gotta see the new mill. And it was in a little cubicle, so it was like, come on and see it. Yeah. <laughs> You're operating <laughs> the mill this. this close to the panel. Yeah. yeah, we had about 18 inches of space in front of it, so you had to like bring a chassis and <laughs> place it. So it was very fun, but I am self-taught on YouTube, learned everything myself um, for, for machining for machining um, it was very it was very fun you know those were very good times but we keep learning and you know now the manufacturing at the company is you know world class leading it's just remarkable the machines we have the precision uh, we now have a 20 pallet station horizontal five axis uh, grove machine from germany super high precision we take finishes from our chassis directly to the anodizer without sanding anymore because it's just stunning. Like it's it's really our manufacturing has come so so far in the last few years, and that's all because of our dedication to kind of bringing that in house, that vertical integration, and understanding the manufacturing and how that translates to making an actual product and designing a product. So. For me, that's sort of what I do. My daily operation at the company is making, uh, managing facilities, managing employees, uh, machine shop managing, and then I do the mechanical design, industrial design of the products, um, and really make sure that everything's flowing together for production is sort of, sort of what I do. So Jonathan, wanna? Yeah, so I also started out of college. In high school, and even as a kid, I did work at the company. I did hand soldering of the boards. Um, I don't know if you guys remember the link deck. Anytime one came in for an upgrade, I did it. Even though I couldn't even drive a car, <laughs> I was the guy there. So, like, it's unusual because I have more soldering experience than people three times my age because I started when I was eight. Um, but, so, like, my first project out of college, as Daniel said, MSB was really small. In fact, when I first started, it was me and our third partner. His name's Dustin. Uh, super brilliant guy, amazing engineer, but he stays at the office. So, um, yeah, so I worked on the DAC 4. Then Daniel started, he came out with the analog DAC, and that was our first like project, the three of us working on it with each other. Um, you know, my job is I oversee the electronic assembly as well, so I program those machines. Um, we quickly realized that if we wanted to control the quality of our products, the performance of our products, and the availability, we need to bring manufacturing in-house. So, you know, we used to have outside board shops do our circuit board assembly work, and every year their prices doubled and their lead times tripled. And they're like, oh, it'll be 17 weeks to turn this around for you. And it's like, I can't wait 17 weeks. So we started with a simple, uh, SMT assembly line quickly realized that that is the future so now we have like a first-class SMT assembly line um, our stencil printer has full 3d inspection so it scans the board with lidar maps the board prints the solder paste maps it measures the volume of every joint um, our pick-and-place machine is way faster than needed it places 19,000 parts an hour but the reason for it is not at speed, we needed the precision. Um, then we have a vapor phase reflow oven, so instead of your conventional oven with hot air, we use vapor phase reflow ovens, which means each part doesn't get overheated, because like analog components, if you get them too hot, they'll start to drift. So like using outside shops, as soon as we brought these processes in, like our yield went from like 80% for our precision components to our last run of DAC modules was a low 99.8% perfectly measuring without any repairs. So to go to 99 point, like that's unheard of that's for like four precision that's analog like four circuitry. In, in Six Sigma, that's like a four Sigma yeah. Um, CPK. Yeah. So, yeah. so, you know, our machine, or as the machine shop developed, so did the electronic shop. Um, it's not as interesting looking as the machine shop because you don't see chips flying everywhere and coolant spraying and you know we use a person to move the boards not robots 
Um, but in my opinion, I personally think it's more exciting than the machine <laughs> shop. But see, I'm an electrical engineer. He's a mechanical engineer. Um, so other parts of my job is I work with all their distributors. I work with Vince. Um, but also just overall like project high level engineering. And then I also do like all the user interface, the render, the USB, you know, the computer side of things, as well as, you know, sitting down and, you know, making it when you push a button on the remote, what happens? Um, so that's, that's part of my jobs. I basically all wear a lot of different hats. Yeah. Um, the important yeah. thing is, we genuinely love what we do. Yeah, so, so talk next about kind of our design philosophy. There are a lot of really great audio products out there. We are the first, you know, won't be the first to admit it. There's a lot of great stuff. There's stuff that's cheaper, it's more affordable. Um, like, we are not in this industry to try to compete product to product. That's not what we do. Like what we do is we make the best product we can make to the best of our knowledge. We want to put as much effort into it as possible. We want to make it long-term, repairable. We want to make it in-house because we care about the manufacturing. We care about the design. Um, so for us, it's all like a passion-driven production. It's, it's not about moving box numbers. Um, and we work with dealers like Tony who care about the presentation, who are willing to put, you know, He's been working on this the last week and a half, getting all of this set up and going. And you know, for us, it's a priority to care about performances, the music, and and while we're why we are all doing this, you know, we're we're doing it because we love this industry. Um, so as engineers, we are very technically minded, um, and in the audiophile world, we do come up against you know the the uh, like tweaks and other things of refining the system. And the way we kind of look at it is. We're designing an F1 car, and you know our customers are driving it, and we don't need to go build the racetrack. So our focus is on the technical aspects of our products, and we work very hard at measurements, uh, quality, and just fundamentally the concepts and designs. So we don't, you know, we don't hyper focus on say buying a specific brand of capacitor, because we as engineers are empowered to come back to the product as a whole and redesign it where that isn't the, the weak point of the product, where yeah. we can do new circuits that are gonna perform better than tweaking a capacitor. Yeah, and a capacitor brand doesn't dictate the sound. Mm -hmm. We make it so the design's insensitive to the capacitor brand. Yeah, so for us, you know, on, on some level, we need to just present the product that we've made to clients, but we also love to sit down and look at circuit boards and go over cool designs. And, and you know, we love making this stuff. Like my job, I get to play with multiple million dollar machines for every day. It's it's pretty much a dream job, and yeah. he gets to play with robots. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I got a robot arm recently, an automated a lathe machine, and it was like it's some of the most fun I've had in a long time. You know, it's just I was jealous. Yeah, it's we we do this because we really do enjoy it. Um, well, since you're doing the machining yourself, I'm actually surprised how small the chassis have become now versus the older ones, the select. So it looks like you're at least 20% smaller. They, they are a little bit smaller, a um, little bit shorter, more compact. So the, the cool thing about these products is there's more electronics in here than our other products. So that's why they weigh more? I was, you know, this, yeah, is, this is the 2024, so these should be weighing three ounces. So, so <laughs> efficiency wise, we've done a lot like with the design of the Cascade in manufacturing because like we're going to the middle and looking at the plate sizes. And like the select back, I designed it before I knew, you know, how the, the mills size. worked. And we designed it like an inch wider than they could yield um, three across the plate. So with the Cascade, shrunk it back a little bit, now we get 50% more yield from plates. So like we've done a lot of cool stuff because like we are nerds and we love optimizing all of those things. This chassis uh, is very compact. All of these are like three dimensionally designed where they have circuit boards on top and below. Weave together, um, it's just, we spent a lot of time on it. It is very fun. Um, so uh, I think next then we will talk about this stack, the Cascade, our newest. Uh, Before you do that, one quick question. Can you talk about at MSB when you're designing a new deck? Mm -hmm. What is the general timeline of when you're starting with, you know, not just an upgrade to an existing deck, but you're going to go, we have an idea for a new, des new design, implementing some newer technologies, 
and you guys sit down, you know, from, I have, I have a project I want us to work on over the next two, three, four years, whatever. Yeah. From that, generally what it takes, the amount of time and effort and how much back and forth and what's the timeline from starting with a fairly newer product, especially in our DAC design, to actually producing it. Yeah, I'll, I'll cover this. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, when we sit down to design a new DAC, it's not like we sit down and say, let's develop every single one of these technologies in parallel and simultaneously. So, you know, the Cascade DAC, the time from we actually started working on a DAC that we knew was going to be the Cascade, it was relatively short, but that's because the Sentinel DAC, which we're coming out with, hopefully in the near future, like in the next year, um, we've been working on that for four years. Okay. Um, so what we do is we go, okay, we know we want a new design in the future. Let's visit clock design. We make clock <coughs> prototypes. Sometimes it goes quickly. Sometimes it takes a long time. Sometimes it takes eight months to get a sample from the manufacturer of a crystal. And so during that eight months, we're obviously working on something else. Um, so like the Cascade came to market fairly quickly because all the different core technologies of it had already been developed individually. So we just had to put it together. Like a good example is um, we have an interface we call the Pro ISL. It's basically a fiber interface. It's an off the shelf. It's common in the IT world. But when we first developed our interface, it was when fiber was new in the IT world. And each module was hundreds of dollars. And to implement it was over a thousand dollars in just raw material parts. We developed it, we tested it, and it was amazing. And at the time, like our analog DAC sold for $4,000, and we're like, well, we can't put $1,000 of raw materials in it for this fiber. So we shelved it, and then when you know, technology improved and these modules became available, we implemented it in our Pro USB and in this as well. <coughs> so this has a fiber connection between the DAC and the digital director box. So like the time to market is really dependent on how many of the core technologies have we already developed. Okay. So you know we developed the, the fiber interface, we tested it with the digital director, the digital director came out of our Sentinel DAC development, which we've been working on for years. And then this was the second thing to come out of the Sentinel development, and next will be the Sentinel DAC. Yeah. So our third partner does a lot of the circuit design. and. He basically doesn't have a role in the facility besides playing with cool concepts. Cool concepts. So he is always experimenting with new designs, fiddling with things. Um, and the fundamental start of all the products is the circuit design before we look at chassis and these other, other things. So as John was saying, the, re the iterative design is like, yes, on a clock design, we'll go through three, four, five physical build outs where we finish the product and build the product. And then we say we can do better and put it put it back on the shelf because with us, you know, we're looking at ten years. That's what we want to support a product for at least. And with those kind of you know support windows, it's got to be really good to 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 bother with. And yeah. you know, it's it's something that drives all of our product designs. Is like we design whole DACs. We've designed multiple DACs, and we just throw up because literally like, finished final chassis you know it didn't meet our criteria or quality so we threw yeah. the design away and started over and we might have learned one tidbit from that whole mm -hmm. journey yeah. and then that we save and put into the next product would you say your commitment to precision sets you apart from some of the other people in the DAC realm and to draw me like well name name but there's other you know, people in your need, you know, that level, at least from a consumer cost standpoint, who are out there and, you know, how would you say you separate yourself? It sounds like that commitment to measuring, measuring, remeasuring, measure it again, yep. and precision. Yeah, I, I'd say precision, quality, and also the willingness to completely rethink. So, you know, like with this product, we've changed the fundamental structure of how a DAC works. And like, that's not something you can approach easily because like market wise, people don't know, you know, when we first came out with the digital director, everyone was like, what is it? What does it do? 
but like that that kind of willingness to try crazy ideas and find a way to put them in a package that works is is something that sets us apart for sure. And of course, after measurements, yeah, you must prove it in the listening chair. Yeah, we are so. we are measurement. Measurement driven for sure. I mean the the fascinating thing about measuring like digital filter design the other guy's the expert But I know for a fact working with him for the last very long time 15 17 well 20 years now is You can change the digital filters by an imperceptible amount It will measure the same the DAC does not measure different but sitting in the listening chair It'll go from the most amazing thing you've ever heard to terrible. Like to the point once my, I remember my grandmother was in the room next door and she commented on the difference between the pianos, between the two versions. She, did, she can't even figure out how to plug something in, let alone anything <laughs> about audio. But the DAX did not measure different. The theory of the filter did not change, but literally changing one tiny aspect of it completely change the sound. So, you know, that's the other thing is like, if you notice, we don't really publish specs of, you know, filter taps, etc., on our website or other technical specs because while they do matter, they also can be misleading and they're not the end result. The end result is what do you hear? So, um, you know, it's one of those things where we have to balance, yes, we're very technical and yes, we must prove what we hear with, with theory and measurements mm -hmm. and design. But it's not, you know, we're not just design. We do actually yeah. listen. Yeah, and that is something that is challenging um, from a consumer standpoint. Is it would be great if companies could just publish, you know, charts on the performance of a product. Like say, yeah. this is the absolute performance of a product. Um, but it simply isn't a possibility. Um, there's certain things you can measure and can know. But you know, for example, with our clock technology, we are doing measurements that other equipment can't measure and we've developed an entire test system that takes you know uh, you can talk about more yeah about so that. first of all clock measurement the term jitter jitter is a very generic term jitter is a representation of a graph uh, <coughs> it really comes down to is clock noise and phase noise so the thing is with phase noise is it depends on how big of a window you look at determines your jitter number so, you know, imagine like in the world of cars, you can say, oh, a car does zero to 60. That's an absolute term. But when it comes to jitter measurements, there is no standard of how big of a window you look at. So you can literally take the phase graph, look at a different section and say, oh, I have a one femtosecond clock. Or you can look at this and say, oh, it's 20 picoseconds. So just, if I may, just to add to your comment about jitter, which is completely accurate, in addition to de deterministic jitter, which is a noise factor, there's also a threshold jitter that has to be managed as well, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And both of those t two things interact in terms of what we hear when we yeah. construct the music in our brains from listening. Yeah. yeah. And the other interesting thing is uh, not only is the, the noise performance of your clock important, it's how you handle it afterwards. So if you had a zero jitter clock, you know, theoretically impossible clock, and you run it through an output buffer, you bring it in through an input buffer, you run it through a sample rate converter chip, it's garbage. There's no point in having it. It's literally better to have something else local. So like in all of our DACs for <coughs> as long as you know we've been around, we always put the clock right as close to the conversion point as possible. It drives the DAC modules directly, you know, because jitter and phase noise is additive. Once you have noise, it's there. You cannot remove it. So it's all about preventing the added noise through the signal path. So. Could you, um, would you say something about the digital director? Is that a, an integral part of all of your DAC offerings or what's its function? So the digital director is uh, new in the last couple of years for us. Um, and with the Cascade DAC, it's the first time it's integrated into the system. So uh, it does work externally with um, our reference and select DACs. Um, so uh, the digital director is first and foremost an isolation barrier between digital inputs and the analog systems. 
Um, we developed like our pro USB and other fiber connections to add that galvanic isolation, and that was very good. But um, we found processors themselves, processing the data is a noisy operation. Um, LED displays are noisy. All of these in inputs are, are very, very noisy. And there is, you know, the fundamental concept of like distance is king when it comes to isolation. You know, if you have a transformer in a power supply, the further away you get that transformer, the better. Absolute. It's just, it's a fact. So with the digital director, we said, let's take the digital out of the system and move it away. So the digital director, it can sit over here. It can be on a different power. It can be completely isolated. And we have a fiber connection that can run up to a kilometer or more between them. Total isolation. And what is it doing? So uh, it is doing all of the digital filtering, uh, oh. signal processing, everything like that, and managing control. So you said that with the cascade, it's integrated it, rather than separate? Yeah, so... Doesn't yeah. that defeat the purpose of the isolation then? So, no, so it's still isolated in this. We'll go over the, the cascade in, in a minute of how it's broken apart. Okay. But just, just to answer that real fast, is basically we've been able to design the DAC with the digital director in mind. So receiving the signal is a better system than in the select and reference where we don't have control over the original motherboard. All right, so shall we talk about the Cascade? Yes. Okay. So fundamentally, three chassis. This here at the top, digital director, as we were just discussing, display, control, input modules, and a massive amount of processing with our new DSPs. A uh, very, very powerful unit compared to our previous generation products. The technology's gotten there, um, and we're taking full advantage of it. Uh, and then here is a power supply. This is a uh, you know, fully in-house designed linear power supply for the DAC down below here. And the DAC is the um, analog converter. Yeah, the analog converter is what we're calling it. So this whole thing is a DAC saying digital, and this is what we're calling analog converter because on a fundamental level, it's as analog as you can possibly get. So if you look at the board, there are chips, but they are basically latched chips that are set up once to point the data to the DAC conversions. So the fiber connection between the digital director and the analog converter is like a fire hose of information. And it is randomized so that you don't get consistent like uh, noise generation. And it is distributed to each DAC module for conversion. So this system is the lowest noise we've ever made in a product. And that only works because of this ground up design that we've done. Um, the analog converter features uh, eight of our hybrid DAC modules. It's a new Mark II design. It's got more clearance underneath it because we've actually moved some circuitry underneath the DAC modules, getting them closer to the distribution because, again, keeping everything very tight with electrical signals, especially these high frequency signals, is very, very important. So really rethought out the whole concept of how we, we work through that. Um, and then we have our Femto 33 clock in there. It's a slightly updated design to make it uh, higher performance for the Cascade, but fundamentally seem, is very similar to the original Tempo 33. Um, and then it goes from there into a preamp section, which is now fully redesigned. It's a lot larger. Uh, Jonathan can talk about the preamp. Yeah, so the preamp, uh, we've, in our products, uh, starting with the select stack and the reference stack, uh, we've always built in a preamp. Uh, you can use it if you want to. If you don't want to use it, you just turn it off in the menu. But it's a constant impedance passive preamp. Um, between the DAC module, the point of conversion, the resistor ladder, and the output, there are no up amps or transistors or any active circuitry. It's not a transformer coupled output. Because of our DAC module design, you know, instead of being the super high impedance or a current you know, based DAC module, we are actually able to parallel our DAC modules and get enough output current to drive your amplifier directly. Um, you know, when it comes to like audio analog designs, if you look at op amps, there's thousands to choose from. The reason why there's thousands to choose from is every single one of them has a problem. If there was a perfect op amp or a perfect analog buffer, there'd only be one, not thousands. So we figured the best way, instead of picking which one we like, is to eliminate it. So we completely eliminated it. 
there is an input buffer for the analog inputs because we don't know the source impedance of the analog source. Um, so that feeds in through an analog buffer to feed the preamp circuitry. But when you listen to digital, it is pure, uh, you know, the output is uh, clean and there's no active circuitry. Um, yeah, so this product also has two XLR analog inputs and two RCA analog inputs. So if you have a, you know, a phono stage or a tape deck that you want to hook up to it, and also the option for a home theater pass-through mode. So, you know, it's flexible enough, you can install it in any system. But, um, you know, we revisited the, the preamp design and improved it significantly over the select deck, but like the exact technology and things we do, we don't really disclose. So. Yep, and then all of this is uh, obviously manufactured in-house, um, but one of our design philosophies is modularity um, for several reasons. In production, it allows for uh, a tighter focus on the item you're making. It allows for individual testing. So we use back modules uh, separately. We can make them in a large quantity. We can measure them consistently, and it, and it keeps it as a external part. Because the deck models are one of the most expensive parts we make. It's really an incredible, incredible design. And if there's any issues with it, we're not throwing away the motherboard or the carrier board that would usually hold that technology. So it's a very efficient way but also it improves the quality and overall manufacturing of it. It also allows us to put them in a very tight space, stacking them like memory cards. Um, and then their digital board underneath the DAC is a separate board. The preamp is a separate board as well. So these are kind of separating up the different areas of the DAC um, on their own individual circuit boards. Um, in the digital director, we have uh, an AC input, goes directly to a linear transformer, goes to a power distribution board, and then a separate digital director board is powered by that. So it's all broken up into the dedicated functions of the units. Um, the linear power supply for the analog converter, it's all in-house design. We've done some improvements with the AC filtering, really trying to attack a lot of the noise pollution in listening rooms in modern homes. Uh, because even if you make a perfect listening room, you've got a refrigerator outside in the kitchen. and just we are always working towards making improvements um, there's a lot of aftermarket things you can do conditioners but on on some level we want to just create as much buffer as possible to to eliminate it where we can as it enters the chassis itself and get the best performance possible out of it yeah um, our digital director supports modular inputs as well so again, going back to that modularity, our, like our network renderer is a little module. It's got a cam system, so no uh, screws or anything to put it in and out. You just simply move the cam arm, pull the module out, put it back in. Uh, electronics, common electronics to fail are small computer parts. So especially with renderers where it have little chips, like that's most common to fail. And in 10 years, you don't want to throw your DAC away because a little computer is well, discontinued. And, and not just that, like by having the modular inputs, the thing that makes a DAC go obsolete is not the DAC, it's not the clock, it's not the analog, it's how you connect to it. It's the USB interface or the network interface. So like with our modular inputs, the first DAC we produced with the modular input was actually the analog DAC, which was 2010, I believe. Mm -hmm. Right now, you can buy a module to plug in there and make it a room ready network certified MQA certified DAC and it's from 2010. It's 14 years old and you can make it have all the current feature set available to DACs today. And we did that because it's a modular input. So, you know, already, I mean, since the Select came out, we've had th four different versions of USB interfaces for it because, you know, as people need higher sample rates or different formats. Instead of throwing out the whole DAC or the whole motherboard, it's just unplug it, plug in the new module, and you're good to go. You know, when Rune came out, all of our DACs became Rune ready certified with the network input. When MQA came out, it was a simple module swap, and now you have that if, if you want to listen to it. Um, and we don't know what the next format's going to be. You know, is it going to be USB 3? Is it going to be a new network interface? We don't know. But we know that in the future, we can make it work by simply changing the input module, and you're not stuck 
with an obsolete DAC. You yeah. just need to get a replacement input. And another performance benefit of the modular inputs is we basically have a selector inside that looks at the module you're wanting to use, it powers it, it uses that input, and is able to disconnect the other inputs so you're not, you know, putting your entire digital input system into your, into your DAC. And that goes down to the Premier and Discrete DACs as well. Yeah. All right. <coughs> Let's see. What else do we talk about? Uh, I think from my perspective, just going back to the ladders, it's important to understand. I, I think of it they're agnostic. They don't care what they, they don't know what format they're playing, they don't know that they're playing music. Everything that gets converted is done ahead of time in the pre-processing. So if it's, you know, 1644-1, uh, you know, we added MQA, as you point out, um, you know, it's, it's whatever is coming down the pipe, things that don't exist yet are, you know, uh, barring licensing or something like that, uh, it's just software. It's, so it's, I'm not allowed to say future proof, but we are really we're really future ready. <laughs> hey, yeah, I think what you're saying is that it's it's format agnostic in its functionality. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. literally and the other thing about the DAC modules, he said this is our Mark II. Uh, in the cascade, we get four times the resolution out of it in the cascade than we could that was even possible in our reference or select. But they're just a module. Um, to be clear, they are not your generic R two R DAC. R2R DACs are ladder DACs, but not all ladder DACs are R2R. We don't go into the exact architecture of our ladder DAC, but it is a ladder DAC, and it is not your generic R2R DAC. Um, I wish it was, because then we'd use like a 50th the number of parts, but... <laughs>
the clock rate for the DAC module. What is that? Um, in this product, it's around three megahertz, if I remember correctly. We've experimented with one and a half megahertz, three megahertz. Um, you know, but that's the the clock. That's the speed at the conversion point. Right. So. Yeah, and every digital filter before it ever ships is over a year of listening, testing, and development. So it's blind tests, multiple listeners, multiple sets of speakers, uh, because everything, because you're trying to basically create a product that plays well <coughs> with as many systems as possible. Um, so, you know, when this stack first fired up, it doesn't, it did not sound anything like it sounds today. Uh, that development process takes a very long time, and it's, yeah, it's good, because it, it, it is, it has a remarkable amount of progress over time, but, you know, we start with the theory. The very first one that fired up, theoretically, should have been the best, but it, with digital filters, you really have to tweak. The most minute things, the measurements come out exactly the same, except it's totally different, and so that's one of those <coughs> listener ear processes of a lot of testing and a lot of music and a lot of speakers to make sure we're, we're in a happy place. And they actually brought this DAC up to the store, what, it was about three months ago, and one of the pieces what, didn't even have a chassis. It was just open, open circuit boards list sitting on the side. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. I'm just curious, when you're listening and analyzing just from a listener standpoint, are you guys always in agreement, or is there some time a little... We keep working on it until we're in agreement. Until you get to yeah. that point. Yeah, so like our philosophy is we're not one person's opinion of what something should sound like. Mm -hmm. We work at it until... You know, we're happy, Vince is happy, Tony's like, literally, we keep working at it until we check all the boxes. Yeah, we each all, we, we all have our, our niche thing we listen for. Mm -hmm. And there, with the Cascade specifically, there were a few times where I sat down and I listened and I said, no, like, this is a step in the wrong direction. And it did improve other things, but like, we lost something along the way. And we'd go back and, and reconfigure and figure out why we would lose something and what we gained and try to get both of those to, to meet. And we also listen to every type of music you can imagine. So if I could just so. add a comment to your question, right? There's, there's the science of engineering that these guys are, do, are, are sharing with us. And just to speak to how they treat their IP, there's two basic ways to, to protect your IP, a patent or a trade secret. And they're choosing to keep this as a trade secret. Yeah. That's a completely valid way of doing that. Okay. The other thing is, is there's psychoacoustics going on, right? So it's our brain that's creating the music from the speakers pressurizing the air. And, and, and so our brains are exquisitely sensitive to things that science cannot determinatively, objectively measure, but we know it when we hear it, right? The reason a, a, a Guarneri does not sound like a Stradivarius, even though they're pressurizing the air in exactly the same way, playing the same note in the same tone, are those sorts of things. And that's what these gents are speaking to when they're doing, if I'm correct, mm -hmm. that's yeah. the sorts of things they're speaking to when they're talking about these distinctions that lead them down different paths of their design. Yeah, yeah, unlike our eyes, which have, you know, a, a fixed amount of resolution, where at that point, extra pixels don't show up, ears seem to scale have, infinitely. Every time we make new products, we expect a certain amount of improvement, and we get more than we expect we could have, and that's why there's still more work to do. Yeah, I mean, it's... You walk into a hotel and somebody's playing the piano in the restaurant down the hall around the corner and down a floor. You instantly mm -hmm. know if it's a real piano or not. It's like, yeah. it's 200 feet away and there's 50 people in the room talking, but you can tell. And so like, that's one of those things where, while this is the best that we have ever heard, like, I still believe there's still a lot more we can go. Oh, I mean, I love going to the symphony, sit there and listen, and time stops. Two hours later, you're like, what? It's over? Oh, it's been two and a half? Okay. Whereas, like, like that's my reference, is when time stops, you know you've arrived. Um, when you do your ref uh, reference listening, what, what system do you use? And is it just a single system, or do you use multiple systems? Uh, so we have a couple sets of speakers that we swap in and out. <clears throat> um, most of our cabling in our factory is, is DIY. It's all homemade. Um, we have a homemade speaker that we made as sort of a reference. It's a very revealing, very neutral speaker that we made in-house because we're, again, trying to get a, a broad spectrum of performances out of the system. 
Um, but typically, we're always trying to optimize for the most revealing. Um, but we do a lot to test how the system works in different conditions. So our listening room is hooked up with 220, 120, and that is on isolation transformer or direct from the mains. Um, you know, our building has solar on the roof. We have a machine shop. So <laughs> our power is terrible, but that's a great development tool to see how you handle bad power. Because if you're testing product in a perfect system and you send it to someone's home and they plug it into the wall and it falls apart, then, then you've kind of, you failed your, your customer. And so for us, the, the testing is quite extensive. Could you speak a little bit about your, uh, if you're not done, if you, mm -hmm. if you have more to say about the Cascade or your other digital product, by all means, but I'm curious to speak a little bit about your your amps and have doing power amps, is that relatively new for MSB? Or have you been building some degree power amps for a while? So we've been doing amps for a long time. Okay. Um, the, the amp started as a <clears throat> one of those DIY projects where we were building decks um, and Dustin, our third partner, was, you know, he had his five amplifiers that he would swap through to try to listen to something. And he just did not have an amp with enough dynamic range for what we were trying to get out of the DAC. And so he made his own, his, his own amp. We had a chunk of heat sink, bolted it to it, <laughs> sounded great. And I mean, took no, it to a show. no power control. You plugged in the AC and it came on. It didn't even have output muting relays. It was literally on and connected, yeah. unplugged mm -hmm. it and it was off. And everybody at the show wanted to buy it. <laughs> so it became a product Yeah, without That's a power switch. That's sort of the so. origin of it. It was just like, it's kind of built out of necessity. Um, uh, the first product, we, we tested a lot of concepts with it. It was the, the M200 amp. Um, and from there, uh, this is the first project, or the first amplifier I really got to get my hands on. And we fundamentally changed a lot of the design processes, but took away all the benefits of the wild, the wild original amp. Uh, one of those things is we have a core design now, so it's a completely electrically conductive um, allodyned core. All the circuits are mounted in a uh, shape around the outside of the core, so it's kind of a tubular box shape. Um, we use board-to-board uh, -board connections, so there's no hand wiring cables between uh, circuits. Um, everything is very short trace, so you know it's it's wildly efficient. If this was built like most traditional amps, this thing would be four times the size for the on circuitry that's inside of it. Yeah, we do a lot of three-dimensional product design. Yeah. We don't just do a flat board. It's everything interacts with each yeah, other. Sure. Yeah, it's a core and also everything's going into the middle space. It's it's completely full. Yeah. Um, so modular design again. Amplifiers are notorious for it's, it's a high power product. You have issues in you know, manufacturing them. You build your amp, put it all together, you plug it in and a, a, one of the circuits explodes, burns, or something like that. And you start over and do it again. You've seen amps where people set the spikes on power cords and they put 50 amps through the chassis and it's like... <laughs> so a lot of companies, lightning strikes. as a manufacturer, you know, you buy an amp from them and they're gonna manufacture it for you. They're gonna put the circuits in, it's gonna blow up. They're gonna rip all the circuits out. They're gonna put the circuits back in until they have a performing amp for you. And they ship it to your home, five years later, the circuit blows up. What do you do? And that is kind of one of the, the, the issues modular design fixes. Because we have modules that are board pluggable for the, the most volatile circuitry, where we can ship it to you, and a local technician can fix it within a day, and you're back up and running. And for you guys, you would just drive it to our office. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That is one of the advantages of having you in the Bay Area. Yeah. So, um, Tony mentioned, so it's 500 watts. Mm -hmm. You talked a little bit about is it class A up to a point, class A, B, class X, Y, Z, whatever. A little bit about the, you know. Yeah, so our amps tend to be like class A on the inputs for the voltage gain, and then the current is not, not because if this was pure class A, 500 watt class A, nobody could be in this room. Um, so, you know, there's that design. Um, the voltage gain is class A, then the current gain is different. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of all we really say about it. The It is 500 watts into 8 ohms. They're very generous on the 500 watts. 
in the worst conditions and the worst and lowest AC mains voltage, you're guaranteed 500 watts. I think these are like 700 watts out the door. Uh, and of course, it doubles down into four ohms and two. Um, the interesting thing about these amps that was a fundamental shift for us from our previous amps and any other amp out there is its input stage. So in this configuration right here, it actually is set up to have a 75 ohm input stage. So it's not you know 100k, it's not 10k, it's 75 ohms. And what that gives us is a like a match impedance network between the DAC and the amplifier. Now most people say that doesn't matter unless it's RF. It only affects RF. It doesn't affect audio bandwidth. But what we did is we literally took <coughs> our 200 watt or old amp, you know, the one that you just plugged in and came on, and we ripped the input stage out and made it a 75 ohm stage. And we were so blown away by the performance that we said, this is the future. We will never do anything besides this in the future. It does have an impedance switch on the back. So if you're using it with something else, you can set it to 1.2K, which sounds low, but 1.2K is anything can drive that. I think we found like one fringe tube amp from somebody's garage that would struggle. But otherwise, anything commercially available will drive 1.2K. <coughs> Why hasn't the industry gone with matched impedances? I do not know. So, well, because theory says it doesn't matter. And then there's the whole theory of, you know, it must be 10 times right. matching from, right. you well, know. Well, theory says that it doesn't matter to this. Yeah. But this cares about a lot more than yeah. people admit. I don't know why. Honestly, okay. I don't know why nobody else hasn't done it yet. But to do the matched impedance, you need the source. Like, you can't have a one ohm yeah. output. Yeah. And so, unless you do the full matched impedance, it doesn't, it actually hurts. Um, but yeah, so these amps are a shift from our 200, our, our, our old amps, they used to be round, they used to be blue. Um, <laughs> the other thing with the core design he was talking about is when it comes to assembling an amp, the thermal performance is incredibly important. And every device must be bonded down uh, correctly. So what we do in these is, you know, we use a thermal interface material that also is electrically isolated, uh, but it's like a phase change material. So once it gets hot, it actually becomes glue and bonds it. If we did that to the final heat sink, we would literally have to assemble them one amplifier at a time. What we do is when we build, you know, hundreds of output boards, they all get mounted to the allodyne plate, continue like back to back. Somebody does nothing except that for over a week. So the torque is perfect, the setup is perfect, the procedures are perfect. As a result, these don't blow up. They're our most reliable amplifier we have ever produced by a large order of magnitude. Um, and each of these plates has heat pipes in it to keep the devices that need to be at the same temperature stay at the same temperature. Yeah, each, uh, each plate has heat pipes for the local devices. And then the heat sinks heat and top cover have pipes. massive heat pipes to keep the entire assembly at the same temperature. Because you don't want a temperature gradient across mm -hmm. analog devices. Mm -hmm. Because the, it's not the performance, but it's the characteristics. The analog circuit changes with temperature. So if you have one of them that's 10 degrees cooler than the other, they act slightly different. It's not one is bad and one is good. They're just no longer matched. When you guys just work on the design of these amps, do you talk about how you're voicing the amp because certainly you know there's lots of amps that have very similar designs but the manufacturers the designers will say I want to voice it this way or voice you know you got something on one side like a, a solid state carry amp which is going to mm -hmm. tend to be more tube like his rich whatever distorted however you want to put it you got some other amps out there that are they are neutral to the cars, very detailed, but some people would say sterile or whatever. Do you think that is just due to their design process, or is that something do you think about in terms of how it's, do you tweak it when you guys listen to the amp and go, we would like it to be a little bit more musical, cinematic, yeah. whatever, and so, think about how. So the cool thing about our in-house amps is they're designed for our DACs. So you know, much like speaker design and amps, when people are designing it for a certain sound, like that's something that we want to avoid at all costs, right? We want everything to be neutral and also, you know. Neutral, but not sterile. Not sterile. Sterile is 
different than neutral. Mm -hmm. So agree. We don't design our amp to fix the source, sure. which is is everything to making it perform mm -hmm. well. Um, because otherwise, yeah, you, you know, it's like we we have a lot of conversations around preamps and people wanting to use their preamp because they like the sound of their preamp. And getting people to bypass the preamp and try it without it is quite a trick because traditionally, yes, you're gonna you're gonna tweak your system for your sound preferences because if you've always listened to bad digital and your preamp covers that over, you're gonna yeah. Yes, use a preamp. That is, you know, that's I mean, ideal. It's part of why we got into amps is because digital, especially the early days, it was harsh. It was grating. You couldn't listen to it all day. So preamps and amplifiers were doing everything they could to eliminate the harshness. Well, you can't make it become unharsh unless you just filter it out. So they filter out the harshness. They filter out the things. But when you eliminate harshness in your DAC, you don't want the mask there. You want to eliminate the mask. So like our reference of the company, it's always live. It's always live performance. You know. Yeah. It's like why not both? You know, why not have the best of both worlds is yeah. kind of right. our, our approach to the amplifiers. Sure. Thank you. Going back to your DAC, the digital filtering, do you do equalization for frequency? No. Spots? No? No, it's flat frequency. Flat. We don't we don't do like EQ and room offset. So, so you, don't, you don't calibrate it to the room? We do not know? calibrate it to the room. Okay. Uh, in my opinion, like to do proper room EQ digitally, mm -hmm. you need a crazy amount of process, like vastly more than we have. Uh, in my opinion, fix the room. It's always better to fix the room. I understand you can't all the time, but you know, why, why mask over a problem? If, if you can, fix the room is my suggestion. Going back to the amplifier, you, you mentioned that the input was class A, but you didn't mention what the output was. Is it a class, uh, I mean, class most of D it's or? AB. It's no, it? there's no class D. Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. Definitely no class D. <laughs> okay. So, um, We're getting somewhere now. Class D, <laughs> in our opinion, has great potential, but the devices just simply aren't fast enough. We've been monitoring the devices. Yeah. Luckily, the uh, solar industry and the energy efficiency are driving the devices to become better. But um, it's not there yet. Um, you know, the main reason why people go to class D is for reduced output heat. We really focused on these to have a much lower static power dissipation without sacrificing performance. Um, we also have a smaller version. It's called our S202. Uh, it's personally my favorite amp. It's small. Yeah, I think there's one in the room there's, next door. Yeah, one in the room next door. I have it at home. Yeah, it's what I have at home it's, too. It's what we have at home, <laughs> simply stereo? because I yeah. don't yeah, have stereo. the space for these M500s, or at least I'm married and my wife says no. <laughs> <laughs> so for both analog and digital domains, can you say a little bit about how you have optimized the circuit boards, the, the boards themselves, in terms of choice of materials, thickness, etc.? And what do you do to damp the circuit boards in your chassis? Yeah, so, um, I mean, they're, they're standard high, high temperature circuit boards. Yeah, um, made locally here in the Bay Area. Made locally, but like things you can do is, you know, like part selection. Instead of focusing on like dampening part selection, you can just change the parts. So like ceramic capacitors, there's two different kinds. One of them responds to vibration and it creates noise. The other type doesn't. It used to be you had to go with one type simply due to physical limitations. But the manufacturing has gotten so improved that you just pick the one that's less sensitive to vibration. So like that's one of the approaches we took in our product. In the digital, it's one type for the parameters needed for digital circuitry. In the analog, it's the other type that's more important for vibration and noise. Um, the boards also, it's not like it's spanning great distances. We have mounting features all over the board, so it's very well connected to it. Anything that generates heat is thermally attached to the chassis or the base metal um, as needed. And then also the circuit board layout, you know, making sure we control trace lengths and impedances and, you know, orientation of the traces. Um, also focusing on EMI, not just external EMI, but the box is generating EMI. So, you know, focusing on the grounding and the barriers. And so, like, we keep all this in mind. You know, we look at our circuit boards, and even though 
the world of audio is not RF. We research as much as we can because like RF design is more of an art than anything else. And what we can glimmer from that art, we try to apply and it seems to make an improvement because mm -hmm. it measures better, but more importantly, it sounds much better. And these are all things that again, theory says doesn't matter but we have found it matters a lot. So, um, you know, that's, you know, it's not like, you know, uh, and then some of our devices, we can formal coat the sensitive analog circuitry. Uh, over the last 20 years, we have found the correct materials to use that actually make it. I mean, we get product back after 20 years. I just had one come back. I measured it and it measured exactly the same as the day it left 20 years ago, 20 years of use no change in performance. Um, the other interesting thing about our clocks is oscillators actually improve with time. Mm -hmm. They don't get worse. Mm -hmm. So the longer you have your DAC, the better the clock performs. Granted, it's, it's really small, but oscillators improve mm -hmm. with time. Cool. Uh, and then just to go over oscillators with one other thing is um, our designs we did for our industry. It's for audio. Most of the time, if you're going with a performance oscillator, your focus is on absolute precision long term. You know, how much does it drift in 10 or 100 years? The reality is that's not as important for audio because you're not trying to keep this deck in sync with the deck next to it for the next 200 years and ones in space. Our designs are low phase noise first, then accuracy second. But pretty much every high-end clock you buy, it's accuracy, 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 and then phase noise. Because like, especially in the communication world, the reason why the, and you know, radar, it's, it's about long-term drift. It's about this cell site talking to this site, and this radar talking to, you know, we're talking to satellites. And they don't, like, it's more important to be in time sync in a year or 10 years than it is right. in 10 seconds. So like we approached our own clock design. We don't use an off-the-shelf oscillator. We develop our own by the crystals, custom-made for us. We've worked a long time with the company to produce it, and they are low-phase noise first. So yes, in 10 years, it might take one second longer to play your song than another. Not you know over a, if you had a song that was 10 years long. <laughs> They're incredibly accurate, but the, they are a phase noise first design, not an accuracy yeah. first. Design. Yeah, this goes back to our engineering first and marketing second. Is like the the marketing side of the accuracy is very inflated, but as engineers, we know that that's not the actual priority. So, yeah. So you said that your amplifiers are made to work very closely with your jacks, right? Um, from an analog perspective, or people who enjoy listening to vinyl, how uh, how are your amps? And what is the preamp that is being used? Is it the digital director that acts as no, a preamp? No, the preamps so, in the the analog converter box. In the analog converter box. Yeah, yeah, this one here. Okay. Yeah, so we have ah. analog inputs there. So basically, this in the analog deck itself, come into uh, the volume I mean, control for the, the, the digital signal. Okay. Um, and those analog inputs are very good for analog sources. Um, even with our amplifiers, it's a really excellent. Uh, we found actually it improves the sound in some ways going through our circuitry um, because we've done some cool stuff in there that does does help. Um, those analog inputs are also individually controlled, like our input modules. So when not in use, it lifts the ground, huh? disconnects it, protects Very it good. from, you know, uh, signals there. And so there's a lot of work put into making those work. And we do sell a lot of DACs, and customers have that analog cable. Switch, switch it in, and it's really great performance. So good those performance. analog inputs are buffered. Yes. The analog inputs are buffered okay. yeah. um, because we don't know the impedance right. of it. Yeah. You know, is it you know a tape deck with a you know a seven hundred ohm output or one k ohm output? It obviously can't drive a seventy five ohm system. So there is the input buffer for the analog, and it is the best that we were able to do, um, both performance but also listening. Um, so you know we have refined that design. Uh, and you know, literally, 
it's I think the best you'll get. Yeah, yeah. There's there's a, a beauty to the simplicity of circuit design where adding boxes is problematic, um, and all in one is problematic, right? Because we we're talking about that space before mm -hmm. about separating things. So. Our dream is to separate the components in the minimum number of chassis to where they don't interact um, and keep the system as simple as possible, reduce the number of cables, reduce the number of connectors, you know, make it as clean as possible because additive noise, less of it is better. So that's really a focus of ours and the Cascade is really a distilled essence of our ideal setup. The, f the feedback from uh, dealers who use the analog input is uh, it's the best their vinyl has ever sounded. And so I think of it like, you know, the phono uh, preamp designer had an intention and that the sound of that, whatever it is, is not going to be changed by being loaded down mm -hmm. driving an input. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, it's a brag, but they say, you know, we've put this through so a $60,000 $60, line stage or a $30,000 line oh, stage, okay. and this is still better it's because it's not, make it clear, it's not digitized. It just gets a very, you see, it's very oh, easy, easy load and turns around and goes back okay. to the uh, resistor yeah. preamp. I mean, the best thing really you can do to an analog signal is nothing. Right. <laughs> if the information's lost, it's lost. Don't try, you, you, you can't bring it back, so. Um, yeah, that's one of our philosophies. Can I just add a comment real quick? Because as someone who worked as a scientist my entire career, what you're speaking to is something that is often not taught at university, and you guys know this, because I know that you know this from the way that you're speaking about this, right? In, in engineering schools, we're taught one factor of a time analysis or science, right? Like, like for a chemical reaction, time and temperature drive the reaction, right? So they tell you you know, set the knob to six for time and measure, right? Set it back to zero. Set the time, the knob for temperature to 12, measure, set it back to zero, right? But here's the key thing that they don't teach university, and you guys understand this, because I can tell how you're speaking about this. Time and temperature often interact together to produce the functional response, okay? The, and, and this concept of interaction is not taught in science courses at university, mm -hmm. okay? But it's really well understood by, by scientists and engineers who work in industry that understand, like, there's an interaction between these control factors, right, and how you're describing, how you're defining the design of these s specific components is to maximize functionality and minimize the consequence of deleterious interactions. And maybe you can speak more on that, but that's the, that's the gist that I'm getting from how you're, you're talking about your design. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think you're, you're spot on with that. It, it really comes down to the, the focus that we have. Yeah, the, the, the result we're going for outweighs all other things. Um, and so like with our company, we don't necessarily have the most featured product. We don't have all the offerings that a lot of modern companies have. But we do that by choice, not by, you know, not by laziness. It's, it's, we, we know what you want to hear is what comes out of the speakers. And yeah, we might not have, you know, all the craziest smart home integration built into this. Yeah, but you can't talk to Alexa. To that is not the goal. <laughs> and so we look at all technologies. And a lot of the technologies we use in the, in the analog converter itself are not standard application for those technologies. We look in other fields uh, in measurement equipment and find cool technologies that have been developed by you know billion dollar budgets, and it's you know public knowledge. And we say, I wonder if that would work for audio. Let's let's bring it in and try it. And that that kind of mentality allows us to do really cool out of the box ideas that perform yeah. just incredible. Because yeah, yeah, like our fiber connection is. A highway like we can put so much data through and that's one of the cool things about the director is we've got massive processors but we're shooting over so much data directly to those stack modules that you know that's something that you can't do with traditional interconnects and, and fiber is not is not susceptible to a whole number of class of noise factors as well yeah, uh, yeah. That, that copper or metal you know, signal uh, conductors are susceptible to as well. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, it used to be, go back 30, 40 years, 
it didn't matter. Single-ended balance, there was the argument, oh, balance, you're just spending. But look at every, everybody here has a cell phone. Everybody has Wi-Fi. There's, yeah, cell tower on the roof. Like, there is so much noise in our world, electrical noise, that if you don't do everything in your power to control that, you're lost. Absolutely so, right. you know, you take a product from 30 years ago and you play it today, and it won't sound as near as good as it did 30 years ago, simply because that noise didn't exist then. Mm. You know, it was a clean world. Just look at our power. It's no longer a sine wave. There's notches. There's flat spots. It's The top is smaller than the bottom. Like, that didn't exist a long time ago. Everything was AC motors, and, mm -hmm. you know, now everything's inverters and switchers, and... It's a very dirty world. Very we cell live phones, Wi-Fi. <laughs> yeah, yeah. no, it's really historical. It's yeah. a very dirty uh, world. We have a guy who works uh, at Google, and he came. He was in here one day, and he said, if you could actually see all the interference in the air today, it would be such a fog you wouldn't be able to see, you know, past your nose. <laughs> yeah. You, you can buy a little Entech power line noise analyzer, and you mm -hmm. can plug it through a wall. You guys know what this is. In, How, in, in you, my you're, home, you're, I can. Fiber interface. I can hear. Um, is that SFP or is that SFP? Mm -hmm. So it's a standard SFP yeah. module and no, standard single mode fiber cable that you would find in the IT world. The inner, the data on it is our own data. It's not SPDIF. It's not. It's your own yeah, format. It's it's literally our own thing. Um, when we use it for the Pro USB, it can send eight channels at three megahertz with air, and then we also send since it's as Daniel said, it's a highway. We send the data down <coughs> slightly, and then we have CRC checking and error correction and de so it's detection it's and correction. So it's only so like used between your own models. It's between yeah. it's between our own interfaces. Mm -hmm. We are working with some server companies. I don't disclose who they are. That's for them to disclose. But I think there are four companies, server companies, now working on a pro ISL output. Okay. Um, so it's something if they want to do it, we'll help them do it. But they got to get their software working. Right? Yeah, and a lot of digital communication, you have like data packets, and you'd receive that data over the fiber connection, and then you would process it. So in our DAC, we don't actually do it in that traditional fashion because we're sending that signal directly to the DAC modules. So that's another way, like we've been able to do our own custom communication through that fiber connection, where we're not having to have uh, organized processing in the DAC, which generates noise that you'd hear. Okay. How the heck does it sound? But we're uh, gonna find out. I think we might get there. <laughs> Sorry, that's another day. <laughs> might, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's tomorrow. tomorrow. Oh yeah. So speaking of sound, how much of a difference do you think it makes to um, separate the components and add extra absorption, uh, vibration absorption, like this big here, difference. versus just stacking them? So this is again where we Inverse say we one. kind of we kind of make the car and let people explore so we don't at our factory we don't use any external devices because we want to know what we're shipping so wait, we don't ship these products we're not saying those products aren't good or well, they don't the, change the sound the extra but, isolators. But, yeah, yeah, but we we focus on what we make and that's where we kind of have to draw a line to Tony, Tony, and and what about you know separating them versus stacking them um, having them separated is good we always it recommend is better, better. Better. You, is it audibly it sounds good yes yes, yes. Um, on stages yeah, yeah, yeah depending on the product yes depending on the product yeah. absolutely this product this product we have done a lot of work to reduce the interaction so like as we design uh the power supply we put the transformer in a place that's less of an effect so it's not directly underneath the analog circuitry and there's, yeah. there's targeted shielding magnetic shielding too like literally for certain parts of the circuits we'll have protections for those interactions. So yeah. we've done a lot of work to make it so it doesn't... I mean, our recommendation is always separate them. But yeah, physical distance is king. It's always yeah. a good idea. Magnetic coupling from a transformer, you can just pick up the product and see the, the measurable difference. The inverse square the law is your field. friend here. What was that? The inverse square law is your friend here. Yes. Got it. Alright, we're going to let Tony take over and do some Yeah, I think so, to make sure we have enough time for everyone to listen. And I would just, uh, there's going to be a number of other rooms with equipment and some other MSB equipment that you can be listening to as well. Um, there are definitely some sweet spots, so I would ask everyone to be, please be cognizant. And <coughs> I'll let Tony drive that, but you know, he'll play a certain number of tracks. And then 
Switch. Whoever's in the sweet spot, please move out. Let other people move in so we can get through everybody. Today. And you can always come back in the future again as well. And it's going to be here next week, like I said.